I'd like to begin by talking about the first technology boom. And uh, I'm not talking about the technology boom in the late 90s. Uh, there was actually a technology boom long before this. Uh, I'm also not talking about the Big Bang. That was uh, arguably the first technology boom. But uh, it actually got me thinking, did the Big Bang even make a sound? Because it happened in a vacuum, right? And you can't really hear noises in space. So I searched for sound of the Big Bang uh, on Google and found some research that was actually just published in March. Uh, some scientists were able to uh, they claimed, at least, they, they found the sound of the Big Bang based on background radiation. I don't really understand how that works. But uh, it was too quiet for humans to hear. But they were able to uh, crank up the pitch a bit. And uh, the creation of the universe sounded like this. I wouldn't call that a boom. Uh, and I'm interested in a technology boom, uh, something created by humans. So when was the first technology boom? Well, I'd argue it happened sometime between the Big Bang and 1999. Big time range. Uh, my claim is that the first technology boom happened about 100,000 years ago. And that's when humans first developed speech. At the time, we were all living more or less in Africa. And speech was the technological innovation that allowed us to say things to each other like, hey, let's go north. I hear it's not so hot up there. Or uh, I heard the food's good. Let's, uh, let's get together and, and go up there. And so we did. Uh, not everyone could speak, but the ones who could are our ancestors. Those are the ones who survived. Uh, and eventually populated the entire world. Now, the second major technological boom didn't come for another 95,000 years. This is the first tablet computer. Uh, it was developed in Mesopotamia around the year negative 3,000. And it's one of the oldest forms of writing we've discovered. Uh, the best ar archaeologists believe that it's a recipe for making beer. And uh, it's written in a, an early version of the cuneiform language, which used symbols. We hadn't invented letters yet. And I'd just like to make a couple observations. First, it took us 95,000 years from the invention of speech before someone said, hey, let's, uh, let's try to preserve some of this stuff. Let's try to write some of this stuff down that we're, that we're talking about. And then the second observation is that they were trying to figure out what to write down once they decided to write something down. Uh, and someone said, I know. We'll tell them how to make beer. <laughs> so uh, the invention of the tablet coincided with the start of the Bronze Age. And this is probably not a pure coincidence. Uh, you can make an argument that the tablet is responsible for bringing us out of the Stone Age. But uh, this proto iPad had a couple bugs. Uh, first, it was very slow to manufacture. And second, it couldn't be passed around that easily. And this problem was solved about 500 years later by this guy, Imhotep. Uh, he's the inventor of papyrus. And you can actually go see this statue of him uh, at the Louvre here in Paris. There's actually three statues of him uh, here at the Louvre. Um, he should be very well known in this audience, widely considered to be the first engineer. And uh, he probably wasn't actually the world's first engineer, but uh, the previous engineers didn't invent paper. So they couldn't write down, I'm the world's first engineer, <laughs> and spread that message around so easily. Um, and so with the invention of papyrus, documents could be easily produced. Uh, they could be produced more quickly and transferred more easily. So this was another really significant invention that Again, building on these previous inventions uh, laid, laid the groundwork for future forms of communication, all future forms of communication. 
Uh, and this made Imhotep very powerful. Uh, he was actually one of the only commoners in Egypt to ever be buried as a god. So this is what some ancient papyrus looks like. And uh, sorry to disappoint you, it is not another recipe for beer. But uh, it's actually the uh, receipt for the sale of a donkey. And notice how long it is. You'd think a donkey receipt would only need to be a few lines, right? Who sold it? Who bought it? Who bought it? When did they buy it? What was the price? But much in the way that primitive computer languages, like assembly, are very verbose when compared to modern languages like Ruby, this ancient receipt was written in a very inefficient language, right? Our language hadn't develop, developed higher level abstractions yet. Um, and so it's very long, just for the receipt for a donkey. Um, and, and this prototype for paper, which was invented 4,500 years ago, is only now starting to be replaced by digital technology. So paper was a very enduring invention. But unfortunately, this technology has the same problem as Rails. It doesn't scale. <laughs> uh, more precisely, it scales linearly. So if you want to make 10 copies of this donkey receipt, for whatever reason, uh, it would take you 10 times as long as making just one copy. And uh, this is not a desirable property. So uh, this is the machine that fixed that the movable type printing press. Uh, most people think it was invented by Johannes Gutenberg in 1450. Uh, but it was actually invented in China 400 years earlier by someone named Bi Sheng. Uh, the machine allowed mass reproduction of books and other publications. And this led to exponential growth in the number of books in Europe from just a few million in the 15th century to nearly a billion by the end of the 18th century. Uh, this is widely regarded as one of the most influential events in the second millennium. Uh, it ushered in the European Renaissance and the modern era. But books have some issues as well. Uh, the good news is they're really high bandwidth. You can fit a lot of information in one of these packets, right? A book is so dense, super high bandwidth. The bad news is the throughput is horrible. At the beginning of the 19th century, the fastest way to move books around uh, was some combination of ships, trains, and horses. And uh, so this is an early telegraph, and it's basically the opposite of a book. The bandwidth is really low. You need to send messages one letter at a time. Uh, it's actually even worse than that, right? So unless you're sending an E or a T, uh, each dot and dash is just a partial letter. Some letters, uh, sometimes it's just a quarter letter. And the story's even worse for numbers, right? You need five dots or dashes to represent just a single number, a single digit. So, the bandwidth is horrible, but the latency is really low. Uh, messages travel at a fraction of the speed of light, uh, which is a lot faster than a horse. So uh, the telegram was perfect for sending short, timely men uh, messages. Essentially, it was an early version of Twitter. <laughs> and uh, many newspapers that were founded in this era of the telegraph actually named themselves the telegraph because the technology was synonymous for breaking news. Uh, most people think Thomas Edison invented the telegraph, but in fact, he did not. Uh, it's actually hard to say who invented it. I, I researched this quite a bit. Um, the problem is it's such a simple device. It, it just requires the sending and receiving of an electronic uh, uh, signal through a wire. So uh, it's really hard to, to say definitively who came up with that first. But if you Google inventor of the telegraph, uh, it returns Pavel Schilling. Uh, he invented the first industrial strength telegraph in 1832. Um, and his telegraph looked a lot more complicated than the one pictured here. But uh, back to Edison, when he was 19 years old, he actually got a, a job as a telegraph operator at Western Union. And 26 years later, when Edison was 45 years old, he was granted a patent for the telegraph. This is despite the fact that Schilling's telegraph existed 15 years before Edison was even born. So, if you thought the US Patent Office was particularly bad with software patents, nope, they've always been that bad. So tying this all together, throughout history, those with access to the latest information technology have always been a powerful class of people. 
from the first human speakers who migrated out of Africa to populate the rest of the world, to Imhotep, who invented papyrus and was hailed as a deity by the people of Egypt, to Thomas Edison, who took his bogus patent portfolio and started General Electric, which at one point was the most valuable company in the world. Today, the richest companies in the world are software companies. Apple, Google, Microsoft. Facebook created $100 billion of wealth in the last 10 years. The founder of Amazon recently bought the Washington Post newspaper. I can think of no better symbol of the end of the age of the printing press. In the age of the printing press, the publishers held the power. In the age of the internet, everyone is a publisher. And it's us, the software developers, who have that power. And with great power comes great responsibility. Uh, no talk on the history of technology would be complete without a slide on Moore's Law. This is my slide on Moore's Law. Uh, the reason that Moore's Law works, the reason why this curve is exponential, uh, it looks linear, but it's on a logarithmic scale, so it's exponential. Um, it's because technology is cumulative. It's because we use today's technology to build tomorrow's technology. Clay tablets couldn't have been invented without the invention of the spoken language. Papyrus could not have been invented without the invention of clay tablets. The printing press could not have been invented without the invention of papyrus. The telegraph could not have been invented without the invention of the printing press. And the software that we're all writing today in Ruby would not exist without the telegraph either. This historical layering exists even within software. Most of our laptops, almost all of our phones, are running a derivative, uh, a derivative of an operating system that dates back to the 1960s. We all program in Ruby which is now 20 years old. So there's two final points I'd like to leave you with. One, the software you write today will be used to create the software of tomorrow. And I hope you take the long view and think of yourself as having a place in this 100,000 year history of human technology. Number two, it took 95,000 years to get us from the spoken word to the written word. And now it's only taken us 200 years to get from the telegraph, to the telephone, to the television, to the internet, to email, to the web, to Twitter. And as a result of this cumulative effect, which we see reflected in Moore's Law, communications revolutions are happening faster and faster. Today, you're on, in, uh, you're on the cutting edge of technology, but don't get too comfortable. Merci.